Good evening, Saints. Welcome to our Tuesday evening Bible study. Glad you're able to join us tonight. I uh, pray that the Lord has blessed your day thus far, and it's just uh, good that you had a heart to want to come in and tune in and uh, hopefully get edified as we get into the Word of God and seek to just uh, break open the Word and uh, get our hearts edified and encouraged uh, as we come to the conclusion of this day. Uh, as we do each week that we gather together, we always want to begin with prayer and prayer updates. And so uh, we had a wonderful, sweet hour of prayer this afternoon and prayed uh, for the saints, prayed uh, for uh, three of Sister Jennifer's sisters that were uh, hospitalized and we're so grateful to hear that they're doing better. Uh, Elder Mark Anthony had asked for prayer. He was in the ER on yesterday. Uh, he is out of the hospital and he is recovering uh, better. And so we thank the Lord for that. Uh, Kalila White is at home. We we thank the Lord for her and that she's with us uh, on our Zoom Bible study tonight. Uh, also be praying for the Minifield family and the funeral services of Catherine, Sister Catherine Minifield tomorrow at uh, the House of God. Uh, 1130 is the visitation uh, funeral at one o'clock. So be in prayer for the family. I also want to add to our prayer list tonight, uh, Sister Helen Parks, Brother James Parks' wife having some health issues, if we can lift her up before the Lord. Um, also, let me see, just kind of skim here just a little bit. Uh, pretty much the same. Uh, we definitely want to add, uh, just per our our sweet hour of prayer, want to pray for uh, Sister Vanessa Connor, just having some health concerns, uh, if you can lift her up before the Lord. And uh, that's pretty much it. Oh, I'm sorry. Failed to mention. Um, Sister Claire, Claire Green's husband, Carl, uh, Green passed away this morning. So we'll be praying for uh, Sister Claire. Had opportunity to talk to her this morning. Uh, she's trusting the Lord and uh, we'll just be praying for her. She's making a funeral arrangements for her husband, Carl, who had recently been uh, taken to hospice. And so his health has been declining. It was expected. Uh, be praying for the family and we're going to lift them up before the Lord tonight. Amen. Uh, again, if there's any additional prayer requests, please uh, contact the church office. We want to keep our prayer list updated. They're being answer the prayer. Someone is no longer in the hospital at home recuperating. Uh, please let us know that as well, okay? Uh, and with that in mind, let's let's go before the Lord, okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, the opportunity to come before you, Lord, and to cast all our cares upon you, Father, because you care for us. We know that you're a very present help in a time of need. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would be with uh, Sister Claire Green, as she's grieving the passing of her husband, Carl, Lord, and had been dealing with failing health for a while, and, and, and now he's passed on, Lord, and we know that his time uh, it was in your hands. And so, Lord, we ask that you would be with Sister Claire, that you would be a, a strength and a comfort to her, Lord. We also ask that you would be a strength and a comfort to the Minifield family as they, they, they um, prepare for the funeral services on tomorrow. And Father, we thank you for answered prayer for those who were ill, who had to uh, go to the hospital, Lord, be there for a certain amount of time that you allowed them to come out, Lord. We thank you for Kalila White, and we thank you for uh, the sisters of Sister Jennifer uh, Cornelius, Lord, uh, Dorletha and, and Charity and Tommy. Uh, we just ask that you would be with them. Uh, Lord, we also just ask that you would be with uh, Dietra Darnell, Lord. She's, she's still hospitalized. And asking, oh God, that you would grant healing to her. Lord, be with all those, uh, Lord, on our sick and shutting list. Be with all those, oh God, who uh, are still maybe battling some various health issues. Lord, we pray for Sister uh, Vanessa Connor. Lord, we lift these names up to you, Lord, and we're asking that you would move in a mighty way and that you would show us your glory in the midst of these trials that you have appointed for us to go through for the testing of our faith. Thank you, oh God, for uh, the privilege that we have to to gather uh, this by this means right now in this in this time uh, in Bible study via Zoom and ask, oh God, that you would guide our Bible study tonight, that you would just be with my mind and my mouth and that you would be with our hearts and that our hearts would be edified, encouraged, exhorted, uh, Lord God, um, stimulated and challenged uh, to take this life that you've given us by your grace seriously. So we bless you, Lord. We thank you. Uh, and we ask, oh God, that you would superintend uh, this Bible study this evening. May your favor rest upon us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, 
my my mic is pretty good, right? You hear me pretty good? Okay, great, great. Well, five by five. Five by five. That's uh it's loud and clear. Best favorite statement, amen, from the military days. Uh welcome again to our 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 Tuesday evening Bible study. And as we uh, always want to do each week, I want to find a way that we can keep each other engaged as we study together. And that is, I think, one of the best ways to engage and have some interaction between us is asking questions. If you all ever have any questions that you like answered, uh, you can email me at pastorvic6 at gmail.com. Uh, Pastor Vic, now make sure uh, Pastor Vic is V-I-C right there, Pastor Vic number six at gmail.com. And uh, I'll be more than happy to do my best to answer any questions that you have. Uh, maybe something, again, that you're studying on your own personally. Maybe something that was discussed during um, a Sunday school hour, Sunday morning service as we're going through the book of Exodus. Love to answer your questions. Love to uh, just be involved in helping you to grow uh, in your understanding of God's word. Amen. So, uh, and also too, if you have, uh, if you like to, in the midst of the study, you can also put your question in the chat box and we'll make sure we access that for you and be able to answer any questions that you have. Amen. Amen. So if there's no questions, and you can ask them during any time of our Bible study, we're going to head in, and I'm just going to launch off our time tonight. I've been doing some meditation in the book of Proverbs, and Proverbs chapter 3, uh, I want us to just start off with tonight. We're going to go into our study on taking Christ seriously. However, I just want to begin our time just in some wisdom literature tonight uh, in the context of Proverbs chapter 3. For many of you all, uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is, is, is probably your life verse. And it's a very good verse. And in the context of the book of Proverbs, which we, we consider wisdom literature, uh, Solomon and, and also other writers of this book uh, give us insights on how to live practically in a broken world. And, and, is, and the book of Proverbs starts off with this reframe of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so uh, Solomon begins the first two chapters of the book of Proverbs, uh, letting us know that before you can achieve wisdom in life, the skill uh, to live life in a way that honors God, you first have to you first have to deal with your heart before the Lord, and that's fearing the Lord. And fear of the Lord is a it's a synonym for salvation in the Old Testament. It's, it's, a, it's also a synonym for relationship after salvation. That that if you want to know the Lord. If you want to come into a saving relationship with him, and what I mean by a saving relationship is that uh, you want to be forgiven of your sins. You want to be drawn back into a relationship with him uh, because now all sinners, uh, all of us are born in sin. Therefore, we don't have a relationship with God, and technically we're considered to be dead in sin. And so to have a relationship with God, there is a reverential level of, of a commitment to submitting to God as the authority in our lives. OK, and there's a warning in the first chapter of Proverbs, chapter one, verse 20, all the way to verse uh, 33, where you have wisdom being personified as an evangelist going throughout the city and compelling sinners to turn. And these sinners don't turn. They don't receive wisdom's reproof. And therefore, wisdom says, when your judgment comes, you're going to cry out to me and I'm not going to hear you. And this is a warning that. Uh, that the opportunity that God has given us today to know him is the opportunity that we must take advantage of because tomorrow's not promised. And if you call out to God when you know you're about to die, uh, chances are that your attitude towards God is not reverential, that you're not really turning from your sins in fear of him. You want to you escape the judgment that you're about to receive for your sins, and that's what you technically fear. You, you fear going to hell. And so that's where wisdom says, I'm going to ignore your cries. I'm going to allow you to receive the judgment that you deserve. So this is how Solomon sets it up. So that when we get to chapter three, uh, the thought here is that wisdom has become friend. We've become friend, friends with wisdom. Wisdom, of course, uh, being personified as a relationship with God. And in this relationship, in this section of Proverbs chapter three, uh, the first 12 verses, Solomon encourages his son uh, to... To uh, he gives his son some commands, and then he follows each command 
with a promise of blessing, okay? So we're just going to go through, I'm, I'm really want to hit verse 12, but we're going to start at verse one, okay? So we get the context and the flow of, of this text. My son, do not forget my teaching, Proverbs 3, 1. Do not forget my teaching. Do not forget my law, okay? But let your heart keep my commandments. And the father anticipates that the son's going to say why. And so he gives him the reason. Verse two, for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. So Solomon is really quoting what Moses said back in Deuteronomy, that, that the word of God is your life. And so he says, if you, if you don't, if you, if you keep your heart and always a remembrance of the law and keep the commandments, here's God's blessing, length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. And the point here is not uh, the issue of quantity of life, but quality of life. That if I live a life for the Lord, I'm not wasting my life. Uh, I don't have to live a life of regret. I can live a wholesome, full life if I commit myself to walking in accordance to God's will. Amen. Then he says in verse three, do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And, and again, we see heart mentioned for the second time just in these three verses. And so Solomon, again, uh, is speaking to his son and he tells him, uh, he's encouraging him, he's exhorting him to take the word of God so seriously that you treasure it in your heart. And the heart uh, is representative of our being, our mind, our will, our emotions. And, and what, what our heart represents is us. And so, so you bind, uh, and, uh, bind it around your neck, the truth and kindness, write them on the tablet of your heart, that this becomes who you are, a person committed to truth, a person committed to kindness, right? Regardless of who who, who you interact with, right? Uh, you're always going to make sure that you're you're being truthful and you're being godly or kind towards someone. Um, kindness is loving, kind, or gracious. So the, the natural response is why? Well, verse four, so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. So if I'm living and committing my life to truth and kindness, not only am I pleasing God, but God will bless my relationship with others. Then we know this verse that is familiar to all of us. Verse five, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Depend on the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Believe in the Lord. Here again for the third time, with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. You may have an understanding, but don't depend on it. Why? In all your ways, acknowledge him. Okay, I'm sorry, that's, that, that's a continuation of, a, of an exhortation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean out on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways, know him. Whatever, Wherever you are in life is where God has ordained for you to be. And in this time in your life, the number one question is, what do I do with the time in which God has placed me in? And Solomon would say, know him, seek him, cling to him. Why? Or what would the result be? He will make your path straight. He will bless you. Okay. All right. And so we see again, uh, the, the word heart is mentioned three times in just the first five verses. Verse seven, uh, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't think that, that um, you have the answers to life and you have um, the, uh, the skill set to live life uh, the way you think it ought to be lived. To be wise in one's own eyes means that you don't need God's instruction as far as the decision-making in your life. You are, I guess, capable enough uh, that you have within yourself all the truth and all the insight necessary to live your own way. And that would be considered pride in the Bible. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Here it is, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And I would say, if you think you're wise in your own eyes, you are in evil. And so here he says, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And the question is, why? Why? Well, here's the blessing. Verse eight, it will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. It's an interesting here that we live in a time where people are obviously watching their diet. Uh, that's kind of a craze that we see on television, gluten-free diets, uh, people who are vegan, uh, people watch their calories, people exercise. 
And they want to actually uh, try to com- try to convey to us that by by being focused on body health, you have better mental health. But, but Solomon's saying, yeah, dieting is good and exercise is good. But if you want true healing for your body and refreshment to your bones, if you want to deal with soundness of body, it begins first and foremost spiritually with fear in the Lord. That's the blessing. Verse nine, honor the Lord from your wealth and from the fruit of all your produce. Honor the Lord. Um, uh, give to the Lord. Uh, this You can say this is in the context of tithing, tithing and offering, tithes and offerings. And the question is, why? Well, here's the blessing, verse 10. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So it's interesting that when we give to the Lord what he has given to us, God will bless us with more. That's what he's saying to his son. Verse 11 and 12. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. Now, there's moments in the life of the believer, and this is what Solomon is saying to his son, where the Lord will discipline us and he uh, will reprove us. He will bring correction. He will bring, bring challenges in our life. And Solomon is saying, don't reject the discipline of the Lord or, re- or loathe his reproof. Now, reject in the Hebrew means don't spurn, uh, don't abhor, don't, don't hate God's discipline. And the word loathe is don't um, allow yourself to get to the point that you become sick of what God is doing in your life. I think we all have been there before where, where God brings a trial and it seemed like you get out, you get through that trial. And as soon as you get out of that trial, another trial. And it doesn't seem as if uh, God is, 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 is giving you any breaks, right? Uh, one moment you're in the hospital, then you get out the hospital and you're right back in the hospital again. You're in rehab again. And you're going through these cycles. It doesn't seem as if you're you're on a treadmill. You're running hard, but you're going nowhere. And and Solomon is saying there's going to be moments in the life of the, of the believer where God just has you in a season where He's correcting you. He is correction doesn't necessarily involve disobedience. Uh, correction uh, can uh, involve just simple a need to grow, to, a, a need to grow in our faith with the Lord. And He says here. Uh, my son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or, repro- or, re- or loathe his reproof. Here it is, verse 12. Why? For whom the Lord loves, he reproves. Even as a father, the son in whom he delights. I was talking over this verse with my wife and I was sharing. It was interesting uh, when we had our four boys in the house that there'd be times when Athena and I would talk and she would share with me uh, uh, just her concerns and things that we need to pray for in regards to our sons, our boys, and she was able to uh, just give a summary, uh, a really a, a summary of the character of each of our sons and say, you know, our, one, our oldest son is like this, our other son is like this. And, and, and she said, and this is why we need to do this for, for them because, because the oldest is like this and the second is like this and the third like this and the fourth, they're going to end up growing up and doing certain things that's not going to be healthy for them. And so we're going to have to, you know, individually in their own unique way, we're going to have to kind of restrict them. We're going to have to challenge them in certain ways, because if we don't, they're going to go off and, and it's not going to be good for them. And and it's interesting when we when we sought to do that for, for our boys, there would be seasons where they would reject it. They didn't, they hated it. They loathed it. They, they didn't understand why they had to, some had to go to a bed at a certain time or why they couldn't go somewhere or or, 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 or not go somewhere, why they couldn't be on social media. And we were just, well, you know, you know they didn't understand that we knew their, their character. And we knew that if we gave them a certain freedom and they're not mature enough to handle it, it would ruin them. And the Lord does the same thing for us. What we will always be before the Lord is viewed as his children. And God knows what's best for us, even though we don't understand it. And oftentimes we don't like it, but God knows what we need to grow into the people that he wants us to be as far as our character is concerned. And so Solomon is saying, don't loathe it. Uh, don't, don't, don't become to the point that you're upset and you're sick of whatever it is God has you in for the Lord loves you and he is doing what's best for you. Just like parents do what was best for their kids. And our kid, as kids didn't understand it, didn't like it. I did not like it. Then my dad would have me in the house from Monday to Thursday, and I couldn't go outside with my friends. Didn't understand it, didn't like it. I had to stay inside, focus on homework. And, and when I when I got older, uh, 
when I was in college, I finally understood the benefits of that discipline when I was by myself and on my own and how the, the, the importance of prioritizing my time in college to make sure I'm doing my homework at night and that I have my free time on Friday and Saturday. And so it's the same as what our kids hopefully grow up and look back and say, well, mom, dad, I didn't understand why y'all did that, but now I do. And I want to thank you. And I, I know my oldest, he said that a number of times to us. He said, I, I didn't like it at the time. Dad, in fact, I asked you to forgive me because I loathe it. I was upset with you all. But now I, I, I clearly understand why you all had to take me through what I went through to help me to be the man I am today. And that's where um, God has all of us right now. And, and, and Solomon is simply saying, don't loathe it. Don't get upset. Know that God loves you. He's not, he's not doing this because he hates you. He's doing this because God sees it way far ahead than we do as far as our path. And he knows that we need to be prepared right now. Whatever it is that we're going through, uh, God is shaping our character to prepare us for the next uh, chapter uh, that God has in our lives. Okay. And so that transitions us to our study tonight and taking Christ seriously. Uh, Taking Christ Seriously is our, our, our Bible study series, and we're in the, in the uh, really in the, the fourth part of our study. Last week, we talked about taking Christ's church seriously. Now, just by way of just overview for a moment, and you have the, the outline uh, there up on your screen, and again, there's no additional notes. We're just going to finish off uh, this study, but honestly speaking, truthfully speaking, um, you and I cannot live the Christian life unless we take Christ seriously. I mean, so this is, this is basic Christianity. This is not deeper Christianity. This is not taking it to a, a whole nother level Christianity. This is basic Christianity of taking Christ seriously. You and I cannot, uh, stand against the devil in spiritual warfare unless we're taking our walk with Christ seriously. Uh, we cannot experience power uh, to endure the trials that we're in, unless we're taking Christ seriously. Uh, we do not have um, mental fortitude and, and, and focus if we're not taking Christ seriously. We will not experience eternal, internal peace unless we take Christ seriously. So we need uh, really uh, to take our walk with the Lord to a level that we were sober-minded when it comes to the things of God. Uh, we, we really do. There's a lot of things. Uh, and I think we, we oftentimes need to know the difference. I think the saying is that some people don't know the difference between play and work. They work at their play and play at their work. Uh, well, we need to know the difference when it comes to the things of God. And, and th those these matters, as it is in the book of Proverbs, is that we fear the Lord. This is not a game for us. This is not something that we take lightly, that the Lord is our life. Christ is our life. And Solomon is telling his son in the Old Testament what the fear of the Lord is, which really in the New Testament is, is taking our relationship with Christ seriously. Amen. And so we covered the section of the gospel and taking the gospel seriously, the person and work of Jesus Christ, uh, taking our relationship uh, with Jesus Christ seriously out of Revelation chapter two, verses one through seven, taking the word uh, seriously, being in the word of God. And now uh, we take the part two uh, within this section of, of Roman numeral four taking his church seriously. We covered verse, uh, we covered Matthew 16 last week where Jesus said, I will build my church. That means if you're in the church, if you're born again, you're in the church and Christ has placed you in the body of Christ and, and you're part of that church he's building and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Hades is the place of judgment. It's the intermediate place uh, where sinners go and they're they're punished for their sins. And so Christ built his church through the cross. He laid down his life. He shed his blood. He paid our sin debt at the cross. He rose from the grave on the third day, proving that our sins have been paid in full. And therefore, we will not enter through the gate into Hades. He will build his church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Now, how do we operate within the church? Uh, we had a good uh, strategic planning meeting uh, with some of our leaders, Elder C, myself, and a couple of deacons and and we were just talking through and just reviewing just an oversight of various areas of our church, uh, from our worship and discipleship element to our buildings and, and grounds maintenance and, and talked about administrative things and seeking to update. And, and, uh, and, and as we grow as a church, we should, um, we should be maturing and have be more insightful on how we can do ministry better. 
for the overall health of the church. Amen. And so it uh, gives me the opportunity to share with them uh, my perspective when it comes to uh, you all and and uh, seeking to fulfill my ministry in your life uh, through the preaching of the word, teaching of the word, and seeking to model Christ before you. Uh, and, and also, of course, uh, providing a, a really, yeah, providing opportunities in our church for you all to exercise your spiritual gifts. And so I feel like as as we're going through the word and teaching and preaching, you get equipped, you come to an understanding of God's will for your life. And you see things within the church. You want to please God and you want to serve within the body of Christ. And you understand it's for your spiritual health, uh, that, uh, it's for your spiritual health that you get involved and plugged in. I kind of share a little bit of that on Sunday. And so as we get into this section on taking Christ's church seriously, uh, we, we, we're going to deal, we're going to deal with how we ought to interact with each other, uh, as the body of Christ, the responsibility that we have within Christ's church to love one another, just as Christ loves us. Now, let me back up and to say this before I, we get into Matthew 18 and John chapter 13, verse 35. This is the upper room discourse. The night of our Lord was betrayed. Soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said these words. By this will all men know that you're my disciples by how you love one another. He said, the only way that you can be identified as followers of me is how you treat each other. Okay, that means that we need to take church seriously. We need to take seriously how we treat members within the body of Christ. By this, all men may know you are my disciples by how you love one another. Not all men are going to know you're, you're a Christ disciple simply by saying that you profess to be a Christian or that they see that you have a Bible in your hand or that you show them your baptism certificate. No, Jesus says this is the way to really uh, be the mark of those who are true followers of me is how you love one another, just as I have loved you. And so we, we want to come to chapter 18 tonight because this was a question upon the hearts and minds of the disciples of our Lord. Uh, this section happens prior to the upper room uh, discourse of our Lord. But Matthew chapter 18, we covered chapter 16 of Matthew. Now we're in chapter 18. And we were, we're going to begin at verse 1 of Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? This was a constant conversation among the disciples, uh, this this thought of, of of having preeminence in the kingdom of God, uh, we understand that they have they're going to have this conversation again as Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. They're going to have that conversation amongst themselves, and, and Jesus is going to ask them what they're talking about, and he's going to put a child in their midst. Uh, they're going to have this conversation in the upper room, uh, and, and the Lord is going to have to correct them again and say, "Hey, the Gentiles, the the, the pagans." Uh, their concept of power and greatness is by those who lead, those in positions of authority, but not so much in my kingdom, for the greatest among you is the servant uh, that's under you. And so, uh, in fact, I mean, this was a, a, a this was such of, a, of a passion and desire for the disciples that you might remember the occasion where James and John got their mother because they were related to Jesus as cousins. And she asked Jesus, uh, that that in his kingdom, if, if her two sons, James and John, would sit on his right and on his left in the kingdom. And the Lord says, not for me to give that. Uh, and 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 so they, they and the, the other rest of the disciples were upset because it's like, this is nepotism. You're using family to try to get uh, positions of glory in God's kingdom. And so I think at the heart of the hearts, we can look at the disciples and see childishness in that. But I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we're all vying uh, for uh, some level of importance. We want to be recognized. Uh, we want to uh, uh, we want to be exalted. Um, uh, we we want people to respect us. Uh, we want to be known. I think the craze of social media uh, is such that now uh, we can just tap on and follow, and hopefully, and we know if people will follow us back, and we look and we see three thousand, four thousand, ten thousand followers, and we feel like hey, we're, we're we we are we're somebody. And, and oftentimes people even go to social media to pour out their personal uh, gripes and concerns and, 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 and they want to look 
uh, through all the hundreds of comments that they receive of people who don't even know really what you're, what's going on with you and, and really are not in the position to truly give you wise counsel. And, and, and we, we get our sense of uh, fullness, our sense of uh, importance uh, through social media. It's, it's in all of us, believe me. It's in me, it's in all of us. It's a part of the fall that we want to exalt ourselves. That's a part of the flesh uh, that we want to be admired. We, we want to have a reputation of respect. Uh, we, we want people to know of, know of us, right? Uh, we want to be praised. And disciples uh, are coming to the Lord with that. And the Lord's going to tell us, if you really want to be praised, if you really want to be exalted, if you want to feel important, if you want to feel like you're the greatest in the kingdom of God, here it is, verse 2 of Matthew 18. And he called a child to himself and set him before them, the disciples. And he said, truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, before you know, you all are assuming you're talking about being the greatest. Well, we can't even get there unless you are even in the kingdom first, you know. And so unless you become like a child, uh, you're not going to even enter the kingdom. Whoever then, verse four, humbles himself. You see that there? Humbles himself as this child. He is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They're like, well, how do you humble yourself like a child? Now, children can be stingy and nasty and fight over toys and all that. What do you mean by, by this comparison of humility as that of a child? Well, a child by nature is dependent. A child knows their dependence. A baby knows their dependence. A baby will cry. A baby will not get out of its crib, out of his or her's crib, and go into the, to the, the kitchen, open up the refrigerator, and make their own formula. No, they, they realize they don't have that ability. So what do they do? They cry until someone comes and feeds them. They cannot change their diaper. They, 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 they don't have that ability. So they cry until someone comes and gives them the attention that they need. And so Jesus is saying, unless you become like that, crying out to God, recognizing that you can't save yourself, you're in mess yourself, you are in your sin, and only God can clean you up. Then you get into the kingdom of God. You got to come like a child. And he says, uh, whoever then humbles himself, verse four, as his child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So greatness comes by lowering yourself, not by exalting yourself. And whoever sees one such child in my name receives me. That's something that's very important for us. If a child has received Christ, this is speaking of believers, whoever receives one such child in my name, receives me, how I treat Brother Les, how I treat uh, Sister Lisa, how I treat those in the body of Christ at church, Jesus regards that, my treatment of them, as me treating him personally, because they belong to him. I think we can say that. You know, if, um, if somebody mistreats my child, they mistreated me. Um, so, Jesus is saying that all of us who are born again are children of God, and how we treat each other is how Christ regards us treating him. That's why you have the warning in verse uh, six. And whoever, here it is, causes one of these little ones, here it is, who believe in me. And we're not talking about children per se, but believers. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble. That means to, uh, the word is scandalized. It, it's, a, it's a word that, uh, it, it, it's figuratively speaking, it, it causes someone to trip them up spiritually that they sin. Uh, that we can, uh, let's suppose that we, we could say that the Bible doesn't condemn drinking. It condemns drunkenness. And let's say I'm with a person who, 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 who just recovered I mean, God has brought him, delivered him out of drunkenness. Uh, he 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 has gone through uh, rehab and and he has applied the means of grace in his life and he's overcome. He hasn't taken a drink in years. And I'm I I I don't have a problem with drunkenness. I I I, I I'm a I'm quote unquote I don't I'm just just hypothetical. Okay, I don't drink. Uh, but I don't let's say hypothetically, I don't have that problem. And he comes over and I and I I. I'm drinking some liquor in front of him and I offer it to him knowing that's his weakness. 
And he 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 knows. We, we've had this conversation before. And I'm playing with him. Man, I know you want to drink. Come on, man. Just for old times. And that brother takes that drink. And in his mind, he feels like he sinned against the Lord, even though he didn't even get drunk. But he felt like in his own commitment and devotion to the Lord, he, he made a commitment that his connection to sobriety is that he don't even put his lips on a bottle. And Jesus says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, here it is, it is better for him to have a heavy mill stump. I got to read this slow because you got to capture the seriousness of it. Um, it is better for him. If you cause one of these little ones to believe in me to stumble, it is better for him that a heavy millstone, a millstone was so heavy that only a donkey could turn it. This big, whole heavy stone for grinding. Uh, it's better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. There was a preacher that preached this text one day. He said, "Man, that sounds like mafia language." And he, 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 the Lord has saved him out of, out of, a, out of, out of a gang life. He was a gangster in Los Angeles. And he said, "That sounds like mafia talk," and it does. And it, it never hit me like that. That's that's like crazy that you would put a you would put a, a a noose around a person's neck, throw the millstone in the water, and just let this person drown. He says, "That's how seriously I take." how you treat each other in the church, that we don't cause someone to stumble, that we don't, um, you know, you've got to be careful. Um, uh, I think by virtue of the fact, and the book of Proverbs talks about this, that that gray-haired people ought to, ought to be respected in such a way that their grayness should reflect the experience of wisdom. Um and when you see grown folks acting like children, that's a stumbling block. Um, we, we need to be careful, about even what we say, how we joke on social media, uh, because whether you realize it or not, people are always watching you. you. You don't have to have the title pastor or elder or deacon or deaconess. Uh, if people know and they know that you claim to be the uh, Christian or follower of the Lord and you, you're you 50 and over, 60, 40 and over, I'll say 30 and over. Uh, there's there's an expectation that you ought to conduct yourself in a way that's that 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 befits an older man and an older woman. And and the Lord's saying here, you can cause someone to stumble on your social media account by what you might post or what you might say in conversation at church. Then he goes to verse seven, woe to the world because of his stumbling blocks. Now the world is going to have stumbling blocks. The devil owns this world, commercials, movies, magazines, talk radio, podcasts, social media. You 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 uh you you pull up something and some graphic picture of some woman or or some uh profanity lace uh commentary or whatever it is. Hate speech, whatever. The world has its stumbling blocks. In fact, there are people that give themselves uh, to promoting uh, whatever uh, particular um, social media account to 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 uh, incite hate on others. Just heard the story of a, of a valedictorian, valid, a valid, a valid yes, and USC at University of Southern California, valedictorian young lady, uh, Muslim lady, uh, was scheduled to be uh, the speaker, the valedictorian to give the, the graduation speech at USC at the University of Southern California. And uh, the uh, the officials at the school discovered on her, her social media account that she was uh, saying some anti-Semitic things against Jews. And this is a heavy thing going on with the conflict going over in Israel. And a number of students, Jewish students, uh, were protesting that she shouldn't be uh, the speaker for the graduation. And she wants to protest now because she said, well, I feel like I was betrayed uh, by my own university. I, I, I was selected and but the, I got I guess they didn't they didn't vet her well enough to see that this was toxic. And therefore, for the safety uh, and security of the, the campus, we can't allow you to speak. Now, when she was interviewed, uh, one of the reporters asked her, what was your speech going to be about? And she said, well, I'm still in the middle of writing it, but my speech was going to be about hope. Now, think about it. How's your speech going to be about hope? And you're not willing to go out and uh, remove some of those anti-Semitic statements on your on your social media account. You can't talk about hope when your hope 
it's, it's discriminate, right? And you don't care about the lives of others. Uh, that's a stumbling block, right? People get upset about that. If you say some hate speech uh, for, for, for people that are Jewish, they go back to the Holocaust. They don't take that stuff lightly, right? You can incite all kinds of things against people. There was a lady uh, 120 miles north of LA in Bakersfield, a Palestinian, pro-Palestinian uh, protester came into a city council meeting and she told the city councilman, you have us coming in here through metal detectors because you're fearing for your life. She says, I'll come to each one of your houses and murder you. That's what she said. And uh, and so people are like, well, you know, that she could have been saying that figuratively or whatever. Like, no. And one the, the, the mayor on the city council said, no, we don't take those things lightly. And so she's in court crying. And they've been they told her that she can't come into 500 feet uh, of city hall. Um these are stumbling blocks. Um, Hate-filled speech can incite others to want to go out and do the same. Uh, we, we, we all are concerned about that. And the world is filled with stumbling blocks. And the Lord says in verse 7, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. But woe, and that woe is a statement of judgment. Woe to that man through whom the stumbling blocks come. That we all got our own sin tendencies, and the Lord tells us in the word that we better make sure that we're dealing with our own sin in our own hearts. Uh, if that thing comes out and we begin to not deal with it in a way that demonstrates brokenness and repentance, and it, com it, it, it's, it comes off to others like that's something that's cool to do, whoa, there's judgment. That's my child. Um, you know, I, I, we were very careful not to allow our boys to spend the night at people's houses. I don't know what they might introduce our kids to. Our kids are impressionable. Uh, you show them something that's evil, they 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 they, they might you know become uh, you know addicted to that or or bound to that, overwhelmed by that. And so we have to think about ourselves when we come to church, how we conduct ourselves in the body of Christ, because how you treat that other believer, Christ sees it as how you treat him himself. Let me go to verse eight, and I'm I'm going to conclude this section. Uh, and that's why he said you got to take drastic measures when it comes to your own sanctification. Our own sanctification, taking Christ seriously, is not just a personal endeavor, but it's a corporate responsibility. Verse eight, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the eternal fire. Now, here he's not talking about physical amputation. Uh, Matthew 5, you say, if your eye causes you to stumble, cut it out, right? Uh, you can cut out your eyes physically. That don't mean you're going to stop you from lusting because that's that comes out there looking upon a woman and lusting. You know, I saw the movie Ray Charles. Ray Charles was lusting, right? So here it's dealing, it's dealing, with, it's dealing with spiritual amputation. That means if my hand, what I do, foot, where I go. If these things are causing me, hindering me in my walk with the Lord, I need to cut it off. That's what it means about taking our, our responsibility with Christ seriously, taking Christ seriously. Here it is. A believer is known by his love for the disciples, just as Christ loved him. And believers are also known by how they deal seriously with their sins. Because if you don't deal seriously with your sins, you're never you're not a believer. Because he's saying this. You have two hands, two feet, you cast into hell. That means you know what you're doing. With, you know you're doing wrong. The hand is figurative of what you do. Feet is figurative of your lifestyle. Remember, you hear scriptures or you read scriptures that say like in, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter uh, 5, verse 16, walk by the spirit that you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That walk is figurative language of keeping in step with the spirit. So foot was what represents lifestyle. If your lifestyle is sinful, if what you do is sinful, you can't claim to be a Christian. You're not because a Christian wants to put sin to death. And if you're not putting sin to death in your life, you're on your way to hell. It says it in verse nine, if your eye causes you to stumble, what you focus on is evil. Pluck it from you, throw it from you. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast to the fiery hell. It's better to enter heaven without sin. Can't get to heaven with your sin, right? Better to enter the life, heaven, having removed that sin from you than to keep that sin and be judged for it. 
Verse 10. Thanks, Les, for keeping it up. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. You see it again. Same statement. He gave the warning in verse uh, six that it'll be a millstone. He says here, don't despise these little ones. Don't despise those who believe. All of us are little ones. Remember I said earlier, going back to Proverbs three, in the eyes of God, we'll always be children. And as a father, he chastens us. He, 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 he allows and purposes and ordains things in our life to shape us to be mature children before him. And he says, we're all little ones. Don't you despise one of these little ones. Don't you look down on anybody in church. Don't, don't you disregard anybody in the body of Christ. Uh, don't you think ill of anybody in the church, even when you've been hurt personally, because how you treat them is how you're treating Christ. He says, do not despise one of these little ones. Here it is, for I say to you, that their angels in heaven continually behold the face of my father who's in heaven. Powerful statement. God the father has delegated to angels oversight over his children. And the statement here is that when you despise one of these little ones, when you call someone in the body of Christ to stumble by your, your neglect, of living a holy life, the angels are looking at, their angels of those believers are looking at the face of the Father, waiting to be dispatched by the Father to come to our aid. I can give you a text, a text for that. Uh, turn to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter two. Hebrews chapter two. So we understand here, clearly Jesus takes it seriously. Uh, he says, better be better be a millstone hung around your neck than you hurt one of one of your fellow believers, your fellow siblings in the Lord. The father takes it seriously. The angels are looking at the father waiting to be sent out to come to our aid. Hebrews chapter one, the last verse in Hebrews chapter one. Christ being declared greater than angels. Let me read verse 13 of Hebrews one. Uh, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make thy enemies a footstool for thy feet? Hebrews chapter one, verse 14. Are they, referring to angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? So angels have responsibility to render service to those of us who will inherit our salvation. Not the initial, not just the initial salvation that we believe and become believers, but the ultimate salvation as well. And there are times in the life uh, uh, of, 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 of Christians where we, we, uh, we get stuck, we're in spiritual warfare, uh, whatever it might be. And I don't know how it works, but angels come to our aid. I don't know what they do. Uh, 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 I know the Holy Spirit uh, empowers us, but also there's a work that the, the angels do. I don't know what they do. Uh, I, I think about Daniel and when he was weary with all the visions that he was receiving uh, in the book of Daniel chapter 10, it says an angel came and strengthened his body physically. I think about our Lord when he went to the to the, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke chapter 22, uh, verses 41 to 45, and he was so overwhelmed and, and he had sweat had sweat drops of blood and it says an angel came to him strengthening him so whatever it is the father is concerned about how we treat one another and if we mistreat someone he has to dispatch an angel to come to their aid and that means that we're in trouble we're in trouble so this leads really to this section here and, and i'm how am i doing with time doing pretty good with time um about the analogy of a of, of, of having a hundred sheep, a shepherd, uh, verses twelve to fourteen of Matthew eighteen. A shepherd has a hundred sheep, and you know the you know the the account, the story, and one sh and one sheep leaves the ninety nine. And what happens? The shepherd goes and leaves that leaves the ninety nine to go after that one sheep that strayed. And uh, verse 13, if he turns out that he finds it truly, I say to him, he rejoices over it more than the 99, which have not gone astray. Basically, verse 14, thus it is not the will of your father who's in heaven that one of these little ones perish. That we can cause someone to stumble and cause them to go into a spiritual spiraling down 
not to hell, not to losing their salvation, no, uh, but to the ruin of their spiritual life, their spiritual walk. And the Lord says, I, 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 I'll, I'll go after that because that, that, that's my child and I will not allow my child to perish. So what do we do? How do we operate in the church to guard ourselves from stumbling blocks? How do we deal with offenses in the church? That's the really the word for stumbling block in the practical way. Uh, someone offends you, you offend somebody. How do we deal with that? We were just, again, talking about it in our strategic planning because um, boy, um, relationships are fragile in the church. I mean, I know that you all, the many of y'all in the body of Christ, many of y'all at, at Main Street have known each other probably 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. And um, we can uh, become so casual and in, in, in the statement, familiarity breeds contempt. We, we can be so comfortable that we can say something uh, offhand. Uh, we say something that, you know, married couples can do it as well. We can just say something uh, that's condescending and do it in a public way, humiliate. And we think it's funny. And we we're joking at someone else's expense and, and, uh, and they can really hurt someone. And, and, and our strategic planning, we're thinking about different things to do. And I'm, I, I'm saying, you know, and all of this is fine. It's good to have programs, but uh, primarily uh, programs never trump people. We, we always got to be careful uh, of how we treat, how we, and I'm not talking about tiptoeing around. I'm not talking about, uh, people being overly sensitive. I'm just saying that we, we, our motive and everything is to love, and 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 that love comes way of rebuking sometimes and exhorting, but we're doing it for everyone's sanctification, and so we got to have the wherewithal of knowing that how I treat you and how you treat me is how Jesus views how we're treating him personally. So he says in verse 15 of Matthew 18. I, I don't think you get it until we we see the seriousness of it. Now we see. Uh, what this concept is. We mentioned last week that the first time the word church is mentioned is in Matthew chapter 16. Now we get to chapter 18. He mentions the church again. And he says in verse 15, if your brother sins, just and, and some translations have it, sin against you. Some manuscripts have that. The King James may have it. So let's take it that way. Someone sins. Now I would take, and I think my translation would say, then it, it, whether it was directly against you or not, you just see that a person's, a brother in the Lord has sinned. And here's the command, go and reprove him where? In private. It was a private sin. It wasn't a public sin. And you want to go and pull him aside and, and correct him. If he listens to you, here it is. You won your brother. You won your brother like the, the shepherd won the sheep that left the foe. But, verse 16, if, and it's highly probable it will happen, he does not listen to you. Here it is. Take one or two more with you. Why? Here's the purpose. So that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. Uh, now it's serious. Now I got to break two. I got to tell two or three others about this in confidence, only not to gossip, but to go to this brother who has sinned in a major way and he needs to be corrected. And the person ought to listen because now you have the mouths, more than one mouth. You have three mouths to affirm. Yeah, that's, that's a sin, brother. Uh, you shouldn't be cursing out your wife or you shouldn't be drinking and getting drunk. Uh, you 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 shouldn't be cheating and lying. Uh, you shouldn't be stealing. Um, yeah, brother, you, you should be coming to church. If you know you have the ability to come to church, you're in sin and probably forsaken the assembly together of the saints. Uh, you need to do that. Two or three do that. Verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, Tell it to the what? Church. Tell it to the church. And if you refuse to listen even to the church, let them be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector and a tax collector. So Gentiles in Jewish society were, were excommunicated. Tax collectors were considered betrayers of their own people. They were removed from Jewish society. Jews had no dealings with Gentiles and tax gatherers. We know it. We know the, the parable of the uh, the Good Samaritan. Man comes down from Jericho, gets robbed. Uh, a, a, a priest comes down, walks on the other side. Levite walks down, sees the man on the side of the road, 
turns aside, a Samaritan comes, takes the man, binds up his wounds, takes him to a, a hotel, pays his, his hotel fee and says, if there's anything else, I'll pay when I get back. And Jesus asked the Jew, which one proved to be a neighbor? Do you know what that Jew said? He didn't say the Samaritan. He didn't want to come out of his mouth. He said the one that showed love. That's how prejudiced they were. And so the Lord is saying, there's a there's sin in the body of Christ is such that a, cer a certain person, people can be such a stumbling block and they refuse to take responsibility for leading an offensive life that harms other believers that Jesus says you've got to remove them or else that sin will permeate the body. It's just like it happened in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 where a man was coming to church with his father's a wife with a stepmother and everybody knew that he was having sexual relations with his stepmother and paul said y'all think y'all be in a grace church by allowing this sin in here don't you know a little leaven leavens a whole lump um i can't tell you how i've seen leaven a little leaven leaven a whole lump within the church because of sin that was tolerated and uh and they're thinking they're loving they're being gracious grace leads to holiness. Grace is not a license to sin. And therefore, I'll just conclude this section because if you're to read further, verse uh, 20, it says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. We've always take that verse, we'll remove it from the context here and say, this is a good prayer meeting verse. You can use it for a prayer meeting by way of application, but interpretation, the two or three goes back earlier to verse uh, 16 where two or three are gathered together in my name to decide what's the next step after they confronted a brother, I'm in the midst. I'm in approval of that. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, loose in heaven. That same language, that same rabbinic language I mentioned last week. If a person is refusing to repent of their sin, they are bound or forbidden from being in fellowship until they repent of it. If they do repent of it, they're loose and they're allowed to continue. Three minutes. Let me summarize the rest of verse 18, verses 21 to 35. Because you see there, that little statement at the bottom there, forgiveness. That's why Peter came and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? <laughs> I mean, that's a natural question to ask when you he just said, if your brother sins, reprove him. Well, how many times he sinned against me? And I'm, I'll, I'll be gracious, up to seven times? He said, no, I say to you, not, I don't say to you up to seven times, but 70 times 70. Uh, that means that they sin and you, you always forgive. There's no limit to forgiveness. And he gives the he, he and he gives the parable of the king who forgave the slave who owed him 10,000 talents. And again, the, the picture here is that God has forgiven us way more. We've committed way more sins against God, better way of saying it. We've committed way more sins against God than anyone will commit against us. And if God can forgive us of our sins and we committed way more against anyone against us, then we surely should forgive others because our debt to God is greater than anyone's debt towards us. We've sinned against God more than anyone will ever sin against us. And that's the point of the text. So when it comes to the church and taking the church seriously, my main prayer and concern is that we be a forgiving church and that we be a humble and a holy church that we realize if I've if I done somebody wrong, uh, even before we take communion, if I know I, I mistreated a brother or sister, don't hold grudges. Don't don't be bitter. Don't hold grudges. Um, come to this. I, I, I remember a couple of times I, I was thankful that uh, a dear saint contacted me and just shared with me that uh, they felt offended uh, that I had not reached out to them. And, and I uh, I actually, I, I thanked them. I, I didn't know I wasn't intentional and I asked them for forgiveness. You know, um, I, I need it. I, 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 I don't, things that I might do wrong. Uh, I'm not perfect. Uh, so my policy has always been, Hey, um, to keep an open door policy. If you have anything to concern, talk to me about it. Now this Bible study is not because I got an issue. Okay. This is just simply within the flow of our study of taking Christ seriously. And I'm glad because it gives me the freedom to say this as a as a principle for all of us, that we should all have a quote unquote open door policy that if you feel that I've offended you in any way, come to me, come to me, help me, help me to 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 see something I may have done that I was not aware of. Uh, uh, 
you know, and I think sometimes too, we all can be a little overly sensitive and call things sin and that technically not sin. Somebody might walk past you and their mind is on something else. And we might take a personal offense to that. Let's, let's, let's be careful. Let's make sure that the sins that we talk about are sin are clearly sins that the scriptures would would declare to be uh, acts of disobedience against God and which would be an act of disobedience against you. But we want to always strive to walk in love. We always want to maintain uh, forgiveness because the more you're around someone, there's a higher probability that you'll offend somebody. And as a church, as we pray for spiritual unity, uh, we cannot maintain unity unless we're forgiving people. And we and and the and the motivation to forgive is because we've sinned against God way more than anyone will ever sin against us. And yet God forgave us in Christ. Now, who are we not, not to forgive one another? Amen. Amen. So I hope that helps. Uh, we're out of time. Uh, and we will conclude the last part next week of um taking Christ seriously, abiding in him in John chapter 15. If you can just read ahead, uh, John chapter 15, uh, verses one through, I think it may be up to verse 16 or so. Uh, just prepare, just read to the end of the statement in that section of Christ being the true vine and us being the branches and abide, abiding in him. That's the analogy that we will pick up with next week. Amen. So uh, with that being said, uh, Thank you for that, Brother Les. Taking our dependence upon him seriously. We'll conclude with that, Nor Lord willing, next week. Uh, just want to encourage you as far as giving is concerned. Uh, we'll be faithful in our giving. Uh, we're thankful to the, Lord, to, to the Lord that at this point we have 46000 left to pay in off the chapel. And so please, as the Lord has blessed, uh, let's give. And we're constantly praying, Lord, bless, increase our giving uh, so that we can be debt free and, and continue to do the work of ministry that God has appointed for us to do. Uh, besides that, there's no other, um, yeah, no other uh, particular updates except, of course, our continuing to pray, our four-point prayer emphasis. Uh, please be in prayer for pastoral leadership, parking, property needs, financial needs, and church unification. Please be in prayer for the Minifield family, uh, that God will keep them and strengthen them uh, in the home going of Sister Catherine Minifield, okay? And Again, if there's any other updates uh, for our prayer list, let us know. Uh, we want to be intentional in being able to minister to uh, one another and uh, serve one another because we ought to take our relationship with each other seriously because Jesus says we should, right? That he doesn't take it lightly uh, when there's family problems. <laughs> we don't want the father to be having to discipline us, amen, because we're mistreating each other. So that's a healthy thing to understand tonight, amen? Amen. Well, let's pray. And we conclude our time. Thank you, Lord, for your word. It's sobering. We thank you, O oh God. We pray that what we heard will be received and that you would sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. Thank you for uh, giving uh, the saints a heart to tune in tonight and pray that this would be uh, helpful, that you would be with us as we rest tonight, O oh God. And whatever concerns that we have, Lord, help us to cast them upon you, Lord. Help us, whatever it is that we're dealing with, O oh God, help us not to loathe or to reject uh, what you're doing in our lives, but the trust that you love us as a heavenly father, you know what we need and help us to trust you, oh God, and not to lean on our own understanding and all our ways acknowledge you and know that you will direct our paths. We thank you for another undeserved day. Uh, in Jesus name, Lord, we ask and pray. Amen. God bless you. Love you, Main Street. <laughs>